Android that's a hot topic, pun intended, right? Um, Stephen, if you do, uh, by the time Debbie introduces you, if you need a few more minutes after your 1030 slot, we've allowed a little bit of time for that. So we really definitely want to hear from you. Debbie, um, you want to yes, introduce Stephen? Yes, I'd uh, like Steve? to introduce my new friend, uh, Stephen Cantu. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm honored to introduce him as our guest speaker. Uh, he is with the Master Gardener Association of San Diego County, and he's been a master gardener since 2008. Uh, he's a journeyman carpenter, a wheelchair athlete, a two-time Paralympian. He gardens on a two-acre plot in Bonita, where he maintains more than 35 fruit trees, a large cactus garden, and raised garden beds. Uh, if you have not seen his garden, I highly recommend that you go to YouTube, type friendly, inclusive gardening into the search bar, uh, take a virtual tour of his garden. It is truly, truly amazing. So today, Stephen's going to talk to us about how we can make gardening friendly and accessible for all. So thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. Well, thank you. So let's get this thing up and going. Um, oops. I think I need to share the screen somehow. Yes. Uh, and same for Stephen as he gets his PowerPoint together, or not together, but gets it up and we can see it, Stephen. It looks good. Then if you have any uh, questions for Stephen, then um, you can uh, feel free to ask those at the end of the presentation. So take it away. We're so excited to have you. Well, thank you very much. Um, Debbie, I really enjoyed your, uh, your, your topic. I'm going to be starting uh, a new program um, because this one um, needs to re, um, get revamped every so often. And I'm going to be doing sustainability and accessibility um together and i'll be starting this after i finish with a presentation to the uh, international master gardener convention in kansas city next summer so um i may be looking at your uh, information to incorporate that because it was nicely condensed and um nicely presented so thank you for that it's um it's going to be a fun project so okay um, designing friendly, inclusive gardening. Um, I developed this with San Diego Master Gardeners. Um, it was slow at first, but it, it's come along nicely and I'm getting um, good responses back. So if anybody um, has a critique, negative, good, bad, whatever, um, you can email, email me at contu at cox.net with um, any input, I would appreciate that because I'm always looking for uh, other uh, uh, interpretations as to what we're doing here, and everybody has their um, their uh, their input. That's the inclusive part. Um, so friendly basically means uh, safe, easy to work. Inclusive is allowing for everybody abilities, cognitive and physical and aging to be part of the garden and garden spaces is just garden spaces. So that's FIG, Friendly Inclusive Gardening. Um, a little bit about me, initially um, I was in the trades um, as a young man in my mid twenties, 26 years old when I was injured on a job site and I fell three stories off a bridge product, uh, project in the San Jose area end up breaking a leg, a pelvis, a couple ribs, and my back in three places, which left me a paraplegic. Um, I was um, fortunate enough to uh, be able then to press the reset button on, um, on my life and make the transition to, first through wheelchair sports. And then um, the master gardeners in San Diego years later, um, uh, allowed me to um, run with this program, and um, it's been a uh, it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's my uh, behind the scenes story. Um, now we're going to start talking about um, um, designing these these gardens. 
So um, we're going to discuss uh, the path to travel, which you can see just a little bit of my garden right here and um, materials and design ideas and signage and tools and universal design principles, which is the very last um, little video. And then hopefully we'll have time for um, questions and um, maybe a, a coherent answer or two, but we'll find out. Uh, but what I want to show you guys next is some oddities. And for guys like me, these oddities really create um, some issues in the guard and in our ability to get around the town and what people do. So this is the first one. And we can see what's going on here. And this is easily fixed. But somebody spent mutual dollars on uh, putting it into this little ramp. And... Um, and then uh, somebody decided to have a design change. So that's just one. And now this one is obvious and it's beyond words uh, when I see things like this. But um, on the right, I mean, this is um, a quick way to the grave, quite frankly. To the left is just ridiculous, but this is what happens. And of course, this is, I've encountered numerous times. And what do you do? I go find some pebbles and I toss them at the window to get people's attention. I, I, I have no words for this. Again. And I was giving this presentation to some school kids and there was a kid there who spoke and could read the, um, this, uh, this language and uh, pretty much said, yeah, it means accessible path, which it does, but it's, um, mm, let's just say, understated to the danger of what's going on here. And again, I... Um, we just have to, uh, to restate that uh, we have rules, we have information out there, and people tend to um, ignore that because they think they know better, and, and you end up with something as silly as this. Okay, so let's start talking about the path to travel. The path to travel uh, would be in school gardens or home gardens or your community garden. It would be from, say, at the home where you park your vehicle to how you get around the home and how you get around your garden. School gardens and community gardens, where you park your vehicle, how you get to public restrooms, because I feel as though a fundamental right of a community or school garden is access to a, a, a restroom. Um, the path to travel also means um, where you store your tools, how you store your tools, and how you get them to your work site. And we'll be talking in a little more detail about that. Um, and of course, the path to travel is what you have on the path. And in this case, I had access to um, about 24 tons of roadbed material. And I put this down because it was considerably cheaper than um, DG or decomposed granite. And particularly when you add in the um, um, compression or the uh, amendment that allows it to, to bind and stay in place. So this goes in first and then a lesser amount of DG with the amendment uh, will go on top of it. And I probably saved a ton of money doing this, but this is crust stone. And so we'll look a little closer at it. And this crust stone is concrete uh, that was brought in from job sites, uh, ground up and um, where it was soft. And you can see on this screen here, there's a little bit of divots that was formed from my chair. Um, but anything on wheels that use a path, which may be, say, a wheelbarrow or a garden cart or 
mama in a stroller or mama pushing a stroller or um, say grandma that wants to make a, uh, a trip in a wheelchair down here with, with help. So uh, everything on wheels would uh, cause a divot. And Debbie, when you're talking about ordering more materials, my general rule of thumb is um, to have about 20% more materials because here in San Diego, and I'm assuming the same thing is um, in your area, the big cost is um, delivery. So you might as well upfront order more. And then when you need it, um, you um, you got it handy. You don't have to have pay another delivery charge. And the way prices are going up around uh, here is uh, pretty much driving me crazy. Uh, the other thing on the path to travel that you got to keep in mind is um, sharp, pointy, dangerous items. Now, obviously, I got that in spades. And um, I was kind of surprised that my cactus garden grew as quickly as it did. I expected it to be many years down the road before it got to this point. And one of the things that happened on my path to travel right back in here where you can't see, I had a yucca with very sharp um, uh, points on it. And it is slowly falling over into the path of travel. And uh, yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, I was out there and I wasn't paying attention. And it, it hit my left arm. And boy, I tell you, I had a couple bleeding spots and so on. So this is um, something. Stephen, I'm so sorry. I accidentally muted you trying to let somebody in. And these slides are beautiful. Can you unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. We are really enjoying your wonderful slides. There we go, okay. Stephen. So sorry okay. again. And But an All opportunity right. for me to tell you how much we're enjoying this. Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, so here we are. Um, and uh, yeah, so porny, sticky things aren't good and for most, most gardens. I like it. And I'm here in Southern California and I'm in Bonita. I'm a few miles from the coast, a few miles from the Mexican border. And so um, water is really pricey for me. Uh, we live in a coastal um, uh, desert and um, we, um, my water bill may run as high as $900 every two months. And so I'm doing everything I can to reduce it. And um, now that these are established, I don't water at all in this area. So the difference between crushed stone and pea gravel, um, we got to keep in mind on um, the things that are really troublesome for me is um, gorilla hair, pea gravel, Crust stone in some cases, um, gorilla crust stone, uh, and wood chips. Now, a little caveat if the pea gravel is worked into the ground, it's only an inch thick, that's fine. Same thing goes for um, uh, um, senior moment, excuse me, uh, wood chips. Um, wood chips are great, but once they work in the ground, then it's, it, it, it's pretty good. Gorilla hair is just a nuisance. Really good for the soil, really bad for guys like me because it just piles up in the front of the chair and makes a mess. Okay, so path of travel around um, a garden bed or around your raised garden bed. So obviously, I found this on the web the other day, and um, I just thought, Boy, is this a problem. Not only for guys like me who use a, a wheelchair for my mobility, but this is a problem for everybody. And one thing you got to keep in mind is what works for me is that much easier for everybody else. And um, so look at the standards that are set up for uh, wheelchair users. Um, and you'll find that um, having ramps instead of steps having wider spaces, uh, all seem to um, work a lot better for everybody. In particular, if you have a bunch of students who um, have a hard time sitting still, um, you will have to have 
wider paths around your beds and wider paths to travel to and from, like I said earlier, um, where you bring your materials in, where your restrooms are, and uh, classroom and so on, all the need to be wider paths. So I, I found this, as I said, and I was just like kind of blown away of all the mistakes here, but I'm at the, I'm of the age that when I was a child, we would, they, they talked about duck and cover for you know, all the wrong reasons, but duck and cover was, you know, in case a nuclear bomb hit, you know, what are we going to do? Um, I've taken the, the approach that um, by having wider beds and you're going to need room to duck and cover, particularly when you give a shovel to a 10 year old boy who um, decides that shovels anything but a shovel, um, you're going to need room. So for safety standpoints, for just organizations of the class of five foot minimum row um, space between your beds, I think uh, is functional. ADA says three feet, but you're dealing with a classroom. Um, I, I re solid recommend it, at least five feet. So obviously in here, they have in here, maybe just a few inches here, maybe two feet. Uh, I don't see how something like this is reasonable, but it can be easily resolved by, and there's plenty of room here, of everything being moved out and giving width and access all the way around. This guy here um, put in some um, vertical growing. We're gonna talk a little more about that, but they did it a little wrong. The center one is just stupid. It just won't work. So keep them on the outside of the beds so you have full access all the way around. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit about these pergola ideas, which I kind of like the way they look, but functionally, there are some issues. So keep in mind width and how you carry things when you're moving around the garden. The other thing I highly recommend, and I have a hard time keeping my garden neat and clean and my wood shop, um, it's, um, it's difficult. And I understand the pitfalls for doing that. But the garden hose like this um, is just plain dangerous. One of my master gardener um, uh, 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 friends here in Bonita, her 90-year-old mom went out to do something in the garden, tripped over garden hose, and it ended up breaking uh, I believe it was a shoulder and a hip, but um, uh, so these things have, you know, serious consequences and they shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and anybody at any time can fall. You know, most, um, most children fall, roll, tumble, go down steps, and they get up, shake it off and move on. For me, in my mid 60s, I go down and I'm, I'm eating ibuprofen for a week. You know? So it's something to keep in mind that you um, want to look at this safety feature. Okay, now in school gardens, you got to keep certain things of safety in mind. Um, right here, these beds I think are a little low. If you kind of measure this man's knees here, um, you're talking that the height of that bed is somewhere under two feet. For most kids, that seems okay, but you see how this guy is and where it comes to him. Um, so he probably won't have a problem. He won't think twice about a sore back. Where this woman sitting here will probably show consequences of that. So we are gonna talk later about heights of beds and, and, uh, and, and so on. So we'll get a little more into that. The other thing you want to keep in mind from a safety standpoint, this garden bed, and I love this little uh, design here, but um, there are some, some issues. And one of them being, uh, this is on top of asphalt. Asphalt is usually pretty good as a non-slippery surface, but here they painted it. So what are these beds? Great but you can bet soil is gonna be coming out of the bottom here on a painted surface, that will be a slipping hazard. 
So you need to keep that in mind for a safety standpoint. Um, okay, so let's move on. Now, most people, me included, even though I think I have a fairly decent income, I still can't afford something like this. You're talking many, maybe a, over, well, I don't even want to guess, but over $100,000 in landscape design for something like this. But what I want to show here is, here's your travel, travel path of travel coming through here, which is perfectly great. Um, but um, then you got little areas to sit and talk. And we all know as parents or as educators that there's times when you gotta have a place you can pull a kid or a family member or, or a husband or a wife and say, we need to talk. And um, uh, having it off the, the traveled path, it's, you know, it works out really well. So keep in mind a seating area that you can have that discussion. So when you see this, this garden design here, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Your eyes go to either these pillows or they go to this door. And that's great. That's one of the tenets of um, architectural design that you get drawn into your garden or get drawn into the house. And this path here is nice and smooth and pretty and everything you want. Now, as far as maintaining all this, I would just hire a crew to do it. I, I don't want to do that. But, um, but you notice that you're going right towards the door here. I would prefer the, this to be a little more centered, but eh, I'm not an architect. So let's look at this garden. Where does your eyes go when you see the garden? It goes right to these red doors here, which is great. This is a you know, get drawn in. But what you don't see is this and these, and these are tripping hazards. It's a nice straight path. Everything's great, except if you're carrying something and most people carry things that harms out like this or, you're, or here, but out here, if you can see that. And um, so you're not seeing where your feet are. And um, boom, down you go. And hopefully you're not carrying a barrel cactus or something like that when you go down. But um, that's something to keep in mind. So on this garden, absolutely stunning, beautiful. But imagine trying to carry something uh, or push your, your kid. You, know, you want to get your kid out in the garden. You got them in a stroller and... Uh, and maybe it's time to take a nap and you're trying to roll over this rough surface and bounce it, bounce it, bounce it. For me in a chair, um, I couldn't hold something on my lap and try to navigate through this area. Um, also, if you got a wheelbarrow full of stuff, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Lots of times I refer to these stones as um, tripping stones. And um, so, Keep that in mind when you're on your, your path to travel, what the surface is and how you're gonna move about and what is the safest, safest way of doing that. So now, okay. So uh, this garden, um, I thought at first I started looking at it going, well, that's really kind of a neat idea, but what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, we'll look at this. And I like the way they look, particularly if they have um, some sort of vine growing up over this and it kind of makes for a nice entrance. But I carry things across my lap and many times people are carrying things into their workspace. And if this isn't wide enough, you have to stop, reorganize. I end up just throwing shovels and tools around just to get them through areas that are too tight when, um, when that uh, uh, comes, comes about. So keep in mind, if you're gonna put this, uh, uh, this type of structure in your garden, um, make it wide enough that you can get through it. Now, maybe you guys have noticed what these are here. These are wine bottles. Uh, wine bottles, I highly discourage this. Um, for a safety standpoint. And first of all, do you really want friends and neighbors and family to know you acquired this much wine? 
Eh, maybe, maybe not. But most people I know here in San Diego and other places in Southern California, they garden in flip-flops and sometimes barefooted, sometimes in sandals. Um, and one of these gets cracked or broken and you can have your day ruined and your time in the garden cut really short if you end up getting an injury from something like that. So pay attention. Um, this can be very, very dangerous. Um, second thing is, I talked about the five foot space around the garden and I talked about pea gravel with this is, I talked about wood chips for a standpoint of mobility and working around this, um, it is problematic. You can't get into this area. It's hard to get tools and, and equipment into this area. They do have a good idea of a seating bench here, but there is a tripping hazard right here. So all that should be taken into consideration when you're designing and using an existing garden. Uh, so pay attention. It can be um, lovely, but dangerous. So here's another one. Again, pea gravel. Like I said, I'm going to reiterate that if it's an inch thick or and working into the ground, not too bad. Um, but if it's six or seven inches thick, which I've come across, it's impossible for anything on wheels. The other thing here that people don't seem to uh, catch on, beautiful view, beautiful colors, chairs, everything just looks great. But when plants grow into your path to travel and you have to move them to get your wheelbarrow through here or whatever else your, your garden cart or whatever you're pulling through your garden, you have to get up and move uh, the plants. Uh, cucumbers, pumpkins, all those things will break if you're not extremely careful. Um, these plants that are here right now, what they're doing is they're obstructing your view to a tripping hazard. And if you're not paying attention, that could be problematic. So again, safety, part of friendliness in the garden. So it's something to keep in mind. Oops, I should have done that at first, but you can get a better view of, of what's going on here. Um, I view raised beds more for uh, food production. Here they're doing ornamentals and other things, but yeah, that's okay. Um, whatever your thing is. So knowing your materials, this is really important. I worked in the trades for a, a good number of years. And in the last 40 years, i from my chair in my wood shop uh, around my house and in other people's homes, I've done a lot of woodworking, building raised beds and, and so on. And many times I've gotten splinters from um, uh, treated materials. They almost always get infected. I um, been very lucky that I can easily take care of that, remove the splinter and the infection goes away. But for somebody who's older, has a, an immune system that is, um, let's just say, not up to power, um, it can be life-threatening. So you got to pay attention to that. The other thing is, and we'll talk about it more uh, in a second, but um, treated materials uh, have a lot of chemicals in them. If you're touching those things and touching your food, pay attention because you're introducing it to your body. Um, here, this is at the Blind Center in San Diego, it, it, in La Jolla, I should say. It has been moved and I don't know what they're doing now, but this little uh, corner here was set up for um, keeping people from running into that. And, and I don't think it really worked, but what I did when I had my raised beds out of wood, I cut the corners here and then rounded them off. And I thought that worked a lot better than what you see going here. Um, okay, so, oops. That wasn't what I thought. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, now, on these raised beds, um, one of the things you've got to keep in mind is that um, 
this, first of all, this is a commercial garden attached to a restaurant in La Jolla. Um, so it's a little larger than what you would have in a home garden. Uh, and, um, but keep in mind, take away from it what you need and you don't have to do anything this late. It's really too much for uh, uh, most homes to, to deal with, but they have several neat features here that I wanted to point out. Um, a little bit of vertical gardening back here, which is very necessary. Uh, a good path to travel with DG allows you a good space to uh, in between the beds and you can easy access all the way around. You've got a seating area over here. Uh, they had grapes growing over this area, which, you know, got you out of the sun. They also had some uh, 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 water uh, that's always also very important, particularly in school gardens, to have an area where kids can make sure they, they hydrate and they have um, an area to cool off, particularly people who have some disabilities in which they um, have difficulties like I do regulating their heat. You guys are up in an area that's a little warmer uh, than in coastal San Diego. Um, so you really have to pay attention to that. I grew up in Calexico, the Imperial Valley. I know heat. That's why I'm in San Diego. When I saw it 125 degrees in Imperial Valley, when I was in my um, about 17, 18 years old, I just said, I ain't, I ain't doing this. So I tried to keep hydrated. I tried to keep my body um, cool. It's difficult, but having a shaded area really helps. What you got to keep in mind here also, particularly in a, uh, in a school garden, is to number the beds, one, two, three, four, five, and this, oops, 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 oops. And um, uh, you number these beds, one through five, and then wherever your timer is, your controller, um, also have a clipboard there with the numbers on it so you understand that uh, you send somebody in, turn on bed number three, and he can look over there, she can look over there and say, oh, bed number three um, is that one. And it's clearly marked next to your timer and you can easily uh, control that. I also highly recommend that if you put the irrigation valves in these raised beds, that you put it high enough, like I did all of mine, and not in the ground, but in the bed and up high, so that when you have to do some repair on it, and believe me, you have to do repair. On my home, I had 40 valves on three separate timers over two acres. And if anybody says you can remember where those are, they're delusional. You can't. I had a few choice beds I remembered, but keeping all 40 in mind, it's it just not going to happen. So having things numbered, having the numbering core um, uh, uh, in, in uh, easy access where the timer is or the multiple timer boxes are, is really important. Again, keep the valves out of the ground. That's just a good home for bees and spiders and nobody wants to get down in the ground to do repairs on that. And having them up high is, uh, very beneficial. Okay, uh, this one, you know, I got my slides backwards. I'm going to have to fix this. This was supposed to be right after the other one. But here is um, railroad ties. Under no circumstances should this be at the home and obviously not in a school or community garden. Most school gardens um, uh, will say no railroad ties. And it's a good reason for it. Um, Creosote is a known cancer causing agent. Most, a lot of people say, oh, it's not a problem. It won't leach into the soil. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, what I do know, if you're sitting on this thing or your hands are touching the creosote, then you're touching food. To me, that's a problem. So avoid these things. From the standpoint of construction in which I worked with these things, way too often. Very heavy, very hard to cut, uh, very hard on tools. And so 
don't do it. it it's, it's, it's just a nuisance. There are several other features here. People always want to put a guy in a wheelchair in uh, a U-shaped thing, thing. Look at that, you can get all around. There are numerous problems I have found with these U-shaped things. One, if you can't turn around in there and you have to back out, that is a hazard. Um, backing out is backing up uh, is when I usually fall over. And um, then it's a nuisance to get back in my chair. As I get older, I find it more and more difficult. When I was younger, I basically just simply, um, you know, rearranged things and, you know, put myself back or hopped in the chair and carried on. Now, a little, little more troublesome. Um, there's a couple other things that we got to keep in mind here. Hose, I'm always against garden hoses that are tripping hazard. This path here isn't wide enough. And there's crushed stone or pea gravel here, which makes it difficult to maneuver around. Uh, and then once you get a wheelbarrow close in here, there's not much room to do anything else. So um, I'm not a real fan of these U-shaped things. Uh, there is another issue is you can't get around over in here, which means that this area is difficult to maintain. And that would be for anybody. Second thing is no matter if you're using a chair or a walker or able body or whatever, this concrete strip here means, and I can almost guarantee that there's probably an inch Ah, oh, there we go. There's probably an inch difference between this and the ground level, if not more, or the lawn level. So if you're sitting there with your uh, uh, feet at uh, uh, the, the balls of your feet are uh, up higher than, than the back of your foot, then that's an uncomfortable way to sit and stand. And, and so it's going to be difficult for a person to, to work from this end here because of this this concrete strip. So, you know, keep all those things in mind when you're designing your garden. Again, creosote uh, is a no-no. Don't even think about it. It is just, it's a bad idea. Okay, so I really like this barn door. I put one of these in on my greenhouse when I built that, and it works out great. In my garden storage, uh, uh, um, I did not build these. I should change it. I just haven't been able to do that. I've been too busy with everything else. But um, but when I approach a barn door like this, and I um, hopefully I can explain this right, but you roll up to it and you simply just move it out of the way. And then you, uh, if it's ramped like my uh, uh, greenhouse is, then you simply, you know, bounce right in. The ramp to something like this needs to be about an eight degree uh, angle, or another way of looking at it, it can be uh, for every inch of rise, you have 12 foot of run. Uh, that was the old measurement. And for homes, um, it um, would probably be fine for most people. Uh, for commercial operations, schools, and so on. Now, for every inch of rise, you have 20 inches of run. So if that makes sense to you guys, you come up an inch, you go out, the length is 20 inches. So do the math. If you come up six inches, then you're talking quite a bit of distance on a 20-inch run. You may only have room for a 12-inch run. So do the math and pay attention to it. But uh, should be a platform that's flat right under uh, uh, the, the, the door, the, the sliding door. So you get up there, you sit on a flat surface, you simply roll the door open, and then you go on in. Inside the shed, um, where you hang your tools, then um, I'm a huge propon proponent of this, and I wish I practiced it more. Um, but um, I find it difficult in my shop because it's just me and um, things tend to get, um, um, let's just say, I, I, I don't always preach. I always don't practice what I preach and I wish I did. But 
Um, number your tools. For example, shovels, let's put a number three on the shovel. And then where it hangs is also number three. And for the kids, go get the shovel. It's number three. Go get it, bring it here and put it back in the same spot. And uh, by numbering things, it comes in really handy of uh, storing your equipment um, and things get put back. Uh, in my shop, I, um, I tend to, right now I'm working restoring a, an Airstream. And so a lot of the tools go into the Airstream. At the end of the day, they come back in the shop, they get piled. And before I know it, uh, I have a huge mess and I can't find everything. And that really diminishes from the, um, quality of your work and the time to get it done. Okay, so one of the things I also strongly, and I'm doing this, and it doesn't look anywhere this nice, so don't think that uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, got it all right, but I'm, I'm working on this idea. Having Espalade Gardens for a guy uh, who has mobility issues or for anybody, it's just a lot easier to deal with. Um, you're not getting up on a ladder to get the fruit off. You're keeping it at a nice, uh, nice eye level in a lot of cases to grab it, move it, and so on. It unfortunately, it is also easy for birds to find your fruit. But you know, I my idea is to plant enough for everybody, and so be it. You know, but almost any fruit tree, um, you can do this too. At, excuse me, and it will um, be beneficial. These pears on the left here are just extraordinary, uh, well done. You go on the, on the web and you just type in uh, uh, Espalay, uh, you'll find a number of different patterns and, and um, uh, that the Europeans, I think, primarily have developed. And um, uh, it, it really is a, a nice way of doing it for mobility purposes. Uh, okay, so here's another idea of vertical gardening. I would bring, oh, Steve, I would bring the garden, this thing down a little bit so you're not reaching up. I'm having problems with my neck now and my lower back. So I tend to keep things, um, uh, I like to keep things basically at shoulder level and down where I'm not bending over. So one of the things that a gardener must do is evaluate their abilities and also look to the future what you think your needs will be. The most difficult part is being honest with yourself and doing that. And so um, keep in mind that we are all aging and as we age, with physical activity becomes more difficult and um, recovery time is more difficult. And I'm really finding that out now. Um, and I tried to prepare for it and it's coming along, but there's always tweaks and methods and things are going about it. But anyway, if this was a little lower, it'd be easier for this gentleman to work. But the idea is you're working at eye level and uh, it's, um, uh, it will be more efficient and easier on your body to do that. Now, to me, this is just garden art. I just love the way this looks. And um, it's easy to get to, easy to maintain, and so on. The heavier gourds and so on, you got, if you're doing this too, you got to tie them up and um, uh, make sure they're not too heavy and they break. But basically, this is a great way of doing things. Okay, so keeping critters out. Um, God, I think it's been 10 years now, but I had the privilege and my wife and I traveled in uh, Southern Africa and we were in uh, South Africa, uh, uh, numerous places and in uh, Zimbabwe and in Botswana. And I got to visit a, a, a man in Zimbabwe and he was a local low level chief and a witch doctor and all this sort of stuff. So it was interesting talking with him. And he had a garden that um, was behind this huge barrier. I mean, I was just amazed. I said, what's that? And he said, well, I got a problem with uh, zebras, warthogs and elephants. And I thought for a minute and then I had to bite my tongue because at that time in my home in Bonita, 
I was having problems with bunnies. And um, so, I mean, yeah, you, know, you got to work with what you got. I, I, you know, if you got an elephant in your garden, that's just a whole other problem that I don't wish to deal with. Uh, but um, speaking to a, a niece of mine in Patagonia, Arizona, runs a gardening nonprofit business there, and uh, they have huge problems with um, pickery and pickery burl under fences, and they get in the garden, make a mess of things. And it's a guys don't anybody who doesn't know what a pickery is. It's basically a pig-like animal, um, but it's um, um, it's a real problem. In eastern Sierras, where I spend my uh, good parts of my summers, I have friends up there, and they have problems with black bear uh, coming in the garden. And one friend of mine uh, gardening uh, uh, south of Mammoth. I uh, had a problem with black bear, deer, and mountain lions coming through their garden. So they had to in, uh, surround everything with electric fences that were strong enough to keep a bear out. And I tell you, bears are pretty darn smart, California black bears, and they'll figure out a way of dealing with this. But let's get back to this. Ooh, so th this bed here, from a standpoint of a, of a person who has, um, uh, let's just say, uh, weaker trunk muscles. So you have to bend down, lift this guy up, and then with your other hand, lift up this two by, and um, then hold this up, and then stick your head into that thing and try to do whatever you're doing. Now, at that point, you got to make sure that that kid with that shovel doesn't come around the corner and knock down that two by four and, and leave you, you know, trapped in there. So one of the other issues then from safety standpoint is something like that with kids. One of the leading injuries is smashing injuries with kids and small hands. So if that thing were to come down and uh, uh, hit a kid's knuckles, it could be a huge hills problem. So here is my wife and some raised beds that I acquired and she wanted to keep the rats out. And we have a huge problem here. There's a lot of open spaces around my property and um, uh, rodents, you know, rats, mice, lately raccoons in my garden uh, are causing real problems. So I built this thing up and it's hard to see um, Oh, it's hard to see, but um, I got hinges right here. And these doors open up like this. And once they open up, you can easily get in there and, and do what you're doing and so on. The other thing I did here to keep um, uh, my wife's back out, uh, healthy is that I built this up on platforms. And now this is treated materials, but I figured that in this case, they wouldn't be touched and they wouldn't be transferred and they wouldn't be worried about splinters. But the way I built this, come on cursor, is that I set this back so that it's like a toe kick that's five and a half inches. So you can get your toes in here at the same time, um, able to get close into this and not bend over. So you can see right here, um, my wife can get up next to this and not do any bending. So Jan is um, quite happy with that. And I built this saying, yes, it keeps the rats out. Um, but for some odd reason, as soon as I built this, the rats disappeared. I don't know why. Um, and now we got a raccoon. Um, so over here, she said, don't build it. Um, so I did it. And it, the problem is, um, um, you know, it works, it keeps the, the, the mice and the rodents out, and uh, it, it does a pretty decent job. I'm pretty happy with that. And just so you know, the, um, oh, the, um, this um, quarter inch mesh or uh, wire cloth goes all the way around. It's across the top too. And um, one of the comments I had was, um, boy, you could put a rabbit in there and it could uh, eat down everything and fertilize your, your bed at the same time. You know, um, 
then that's probably true. Okay, so let's move on. Flutter. And we kind of spoke about that earlier. But when areas aren't used as much as um, like every 10 minutes, tends to get any flat surface tends to be a catch-all. And I found it kind of interesting, this little raised bed right here um, isn't very accessible. You can't get in to use it. This sign is talking about how raised beds are an efficient way of getting in there, but it blocks access. So you're kind of thinking, hey, you know, okay, good idea, bad application, good idea. Um, the other thing you got to really be concerned about, um, here in, in Southern California, you guys got the same problem up there, but black whittles, uh, brown whittles, all sorts of other things tend to get up in these darker areas. Me sticking my legs underneath this thing with um, um, not having much sensation in my legs mm, 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 um, tends to be problematic. So keeping the areas clean, keeping an eye open for spiders or anything else that may be uh, 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 difficult in the garden is something to pay attention to. So having designated areas for, for uh, stored equipment uh, away from uh, the accessibility issues is really important and uh, keeping it clean from dangerous insects and snakes and so on is also really important. So all that needs to be taken into consideration. So we, you spoke earlier, Debbie, about hydroponics. I feel that they're a great way for accessibility. Got to, um, uh, I haven't done uh, hydroponics. I want to, at some point I'm gonna get into it, but uh, it's a great way like Espelay to get up close to the, whatever you're working on. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I just think it's, it's one of many great things to consider in your garden. The upstart, uh, the cost it may be prohibitive for some people, but it's, um, it's at least worth looking into. Now, start small. If you're new to gardening, uh, I highly recommend that you do something that's right next to your kitchen where you can get kitchen herbs. And I just love uh, kitchen gardens. I love cooking with fresh herbs, particularly tarragon and basils and mints. It, it's just, uh, to me, I, I just love going out and getting that and throwing it into a dish. Um, so it should be close to the kitchen. I have, my two acres is on a narrow property and, um, which means that um, my garden, when I initially set it up, was about, I would say, a good 40 to 50 yards away from the kitchen, which was problematic. And I learned quite quickly, I didn't want to go out there as much as I should to get what I needed. It was just too far to go. Um, so I brought things in closer and um, used uh, that area for um, my uh, restoration on the airstream, which is a, a lot more efficient for me. But the, um, so start small, add on slowly, um, and um, be aware of the budget. Things are very expensive now, uh, materials. So you, you got to keep all that in mind. And this is just a fun idea. I had to throw this in because I just think this is really neat. Not very accessible. And I wouldn't want to put a blind guy in here. Um, that would just be mean. But you um, uh, definitely, kids love stuff like this. And uh, if you have somebody to maintain it, it's great. I, I just think it's, it's a fun idea. But uh, if you look closely, you see that these guys up here are tied up. So for somebody like me to harvest this, it, it would be impossible. Um, but um, I just think it, it's gorgeous. Um, garden accessories. I built uh, something like this for um, friends of mine. And um, it uh, comes in really handy, particularly if you want to um, lay a garden tool on here or to sit down. Lots of times I get called away and I um, 
need to put my garden tool somewhere. And by putting it on something like this, it um, helps me find it when I get back. Because um, it's, um, I, I'm sure you guys have all run into this where you lay a garden tool down and you come back later and go, God, what was I doing? What was there? And by having something in the open like this comes in really handy to uh, then it's in your vision. The other thing that really helps is to, when you lay something down, take a mental picture of it. And then when you come back, you'll have an uh, idea of what you're looking for. Okay, so another, you know, some more practical ideas. Um, you saw I have some of these birdie beds in my, in my garden. There's alternatives to that. And uh, livestock watering bins is what's sold in a number of places and a number of companies are catching on that um, when I checked into these things last time, the cost of a bed similar to this has gone up dramatically. But uh, initially when I bought mine, there were oh right around $100. Now I think they're around $140, $150. But don't quote me, prices are going up like crazy. But um, if you do get a livestock uh, watering bin and turn it into a raised bed, make sure it has a drain on it. Um, and and do, not do not drill holes into the galvanized steel because galvanized is on top of metal and or steel and the steel will rust and it, it won't last that long. Um, but what I did with these on mine, they were sitting a little lower and so I put a hose bib on there and then put a clear hose on it. And it didn't last that long. So I have to change them out because it, they, uh, it got full of crud. But basically by having a clear hose on there, you're able to um, then see how much water is in the bed uh, through that clean hose, clear hose, plastic hose. And then I would drop the hose down take out the water and put it, use it somewhere else. Uh, that came in very handy. So um, take advantage of the drain plug and reuse your water. Um, okay, so now these things, it's kind of an industrial look, but if you're doing small crops, um, short crops, strawberries, stuff like that, these things work great. What you got to remember on stuff like this is that air gets all the way around it uh, and they dry out quickly, they take more water. So you gotta you know, pay attention to that. Um, I'm assuming water costs in your area is as high as it is here. Um, so that is a resource that we have to nurture and pay attention to. Um, so people always ask me what not to plant and raise beds. I, I don't like planting corn in raised beds because I don't like the idea of getting a ladder out to pick corn um, or to harvest your corn. So keep in mind what you're planting here and what the end result is going to be. Uh, if you have to get up on a step stool or a ladder to pick your garden vegetables, uh, you know, that's just a non-starter to me. Got to pay attention. So, uh, adapted raised beds. I don't like the word adapted, uh, but um, because everything's adapted for something. A wrench is adapted to a certain type of nut that you're trying or a bolt that you're trying to manipulate. So, um, but it's what the common use is and adaptive in case, so it's adapted. But here, there, there are several things to keep in mind. Um, when I use these, and I have something similar to this in, in my garden, and I, um, um, when I'm under this, I learn fairly quickly, don't water and be under this thing, because then you're going to be explaining to friends or family that you really don't have a bladder issue, you have a watering issue here with this garden bed. And uh, you, you kind of have to pay attention to... Uh, you know, do you really want to get soaking wet? And um, and uh, uh, and so, you know, you got to sit to the side when you're watering. The other thing I notice in my bed that has a similar um, uh, angle here is that things that are planted next to this edge don't do as well as things that are planted in the center that have more depth. 
Um, the other thing to keep in mind is I'd like the idea of having uh, uh, accessible beds for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but when somebody is assigned to this, they're excluded from the rest of the group. Now, um, I would strongly suggest that part of my inclusiveness in the garden is that everybody works together and everybody uh, works in a partnership with somebody else. So that the kid uh, who happens to be uh, um, a mobility issue for that, for who knows what reason, it could be simply that the kid broke his leg or broke an arm or whatever. And, you know, during the, the healing process, they need a little extra help. Or, you know, you may have a kid who uh, oh, is born with a disability, God forbid. But, you know, it, it happens quite often. And um, so they need to be inclusive. I've taken the approach over the years that you can learn from anybody at any time. And um, a person, uh, just because they're... Uh, in a chair or you know have some mobility issues uh you know can't be that uh, that vessel that you can learn from um and at the very least you can learn your level of compassion for your fellow human being which is no small feat for some people um so keep in mind that everybody works together and that everybody uh, has a partner in the garden and it it it, it really helps out uh, all the way around and everybody can learn. Symbols and signage and so on. Here, um, I, I brought this picture up because I'm kind of a, a, a sucker for cave art. I just love this stuff. And we call these guys um, cavemen primitive and so on. But you know, this, uh, this artwork uh, really shows insight that they use these for um, education, for religious purposes, for knowing when to go hunting, all sorts of stuff. And um, things that we can't even probably understand because this is out our, outside of our, our realm. But um, signage is really important, but when you have signage like this, um, you got too much and they become a blur and people don't seem to uh, then catch on. So. Limit your signage to what is important, what is necessary, what is um, uh, uh, direct, and if the sign is the appropriate signage for the distance of what it's seen. You can go online and find out what that is, but if somebody's looking at a sign that's three by three inches by three inches and it's sixty feet away, well, there's what's the purpose? It just won't work. Um, so um, if a signage is um, um, large enough for the distance which is being viewed is, is what I'm trying to say is important. And you can get those numbers online. But the other thing is lots of uh, school gardens that I've worked with here in the San Diego area um, put up signage thanking local groups that um, will give you um, merchandise or help support the school or community garden. And that's important to do. But don't make it so so cluttered that it becomes a basically visual uh, becomes invisible because there's too much to take in. Um, but just so you guys know, here in San Diego, and I'm sure it's up at your place, um, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and, and so on all have budgets for giving uh, a, a, away products at discounted price or free to community and school gardens. But um, so develop a relationship with um, your local big box stores and the irrigation stores. Site one that used to be Hydroscape also was working uh, with school and community gardens giving discount or at cost prices. So develop a relationship with those guys if you're working with a community of school garden. Um, and uh, it will, um, I think, um, should be um, uh, beneficial. And then give them some signage and thanking them for that. Uh, the, um, for the home gardener, uh, I, I spent a lot of times looking and asking for discounts just because 
you know, what can they say? No, not today. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. This thought I'd ask. So um, pay attention to that. And uh, uh, I hope you get some deals. Now, signage for planting. How many times, I can't even count how many times this has happened to me, where I'm planting something in my garden and somebody calls me away. I come back and I say, uh oh, was this, what, what was I planning here? So for kids to have a, a project, grandkids, school kids, whatever, or even adults, put out some signage, you know, uh, before you start planting. This is my eggplant, bell peppers, watermelon in this case. And um, make yourselves, and they're great memory clues. And when you get pulled away, you come back and you got, uh, you, you, you know what you're doing. And um, actually, it, it makes you look really smart when in fact it's just a necessary way of going about doing things. And people go, oh, isn't that clever? Well, it ain't clever, it's necessary. So um, adapted tools, again, the whole adapted thing I, you know, I, I got issues with. Um, but anyway, um, the right tool for the job, and you can see here that these things, I just went through um, uh, surgery on copal tunnel and cubic nerve uh, uh, on my elbows. And it took me quite a while. Uh, and it's resolved a number of issues and kind of developed a couple more. But nevertheless, um, these tools have helped me out quite a bit in, in my garden when copal tunnel was really bothering me. But I've gotten those things fixed. But Keep in mind that these things are efficient. They're a good way of going about it. And if you just go to uh, the, the web uh, and type in adapted tools, you'll see these things. Amazon has a full uh, line of these and so does other people. But um, look at this. If it fits your needs, don't be afraid to use it. This says $2.99. I would... Um, and this was done in 2010. So I would bet you that's $5 or $7 now, but um, pay attention to price. Sometimes this stuff goes on sale. And uh, so if you need it, don't, uh, you know, don't, you know, go, go for it and check it out. Maybe not buy all of them, but buy what you need and test it out and see uh, how it'll work for you. Um, Okay, so I have some of these. These are cordless electric pruning shears. Um, can be really dangerous once you use them. I am um, uh, really big on safety. I only want to be an industrial accident once. And, uh, but um, I thought I was buying one of these cordless electric pruners that um, um, if you're, skin is touching this blade or this blade here, it won't work. But when I got it home, I realized that it wasn't one of those. And so when I use this tool, um, it can be really scary. Um, so keep your fingers away, please. But it works really well um, if you have weaker hands and you need to cut, um, trim up a tree or whatever. So it's something to keep in mind. They're not cheap, but they're very, uh, uh, I think, uh, work very well in the garden, but keep safety in mind. Now, this guy here, this is just some of the tools I use in my demonstrations. Um, reachers, I have one in almost every room of the house, and it comes in really handy inside. It comes in really handy in the garden for picking fruit or picking stuff up out of the ground, off the ground. And one of the things I've noticed, anything that um, increases my reach um, also uh, improves my mobility. So I don't have to, you know, move, readjust, and carry tools. I can, you know, work in, in greater distance and get things done. That's why I like long handle rakes in which I can uh, work uh, raking up things and um uh, a larger area and then move on and now work on another area. This tool here is a reaching pruner. Now, I should have um, taken a picture of a, my newer one. 
but here and here it has these little jaws. So these come in really handy when you're pruning roses or anything with thorns on it, because you can clip off the rose, for example, and, um, and then you can take it and it will clamp onto the piece that you've cut off and then drop it right into the garbage can or into the whatever you're you're doing and you keep your arms out of all the start sharp thorns uh of the roses one of my master gardener um uh, buddies uh lost an eye and i don't know exactly how this happened but he was trimming roses and he got stuck in the eye and uh, developed an infection and he lost use of, of one eye because of that but by having a reacher a uh, pruning device here, it would kept him out of the way of danger and it worked out really nice. It would work out really nice for, for, for a lot of people. Now this tool and this tool all have uh, foam gripping on it that helps quite a bit. And uh, uh, if you have, uh, well, let's put it this way. My hands are permanently tired from pushing my chair around. And uh, when I use pruners, I uh, tend, or other tools, my hands just can't hold the grip anymore. So by having these tools with this grip on it, along with gloves that have a grip on it, like these guys here, I use far less strength in my hands. And then this little easy gripping tool, which you can find on Amazon, will wrap around the back of your hand and then slide back on here. And it comes in really handy if your hands are tired a week or so on. So that uh, is something to keep in mind. Um, also, I have multiple size pruners. And um, I found that the smaller ones work better in my hands than the larger tools. It's good if you're able to have, um, to take the time and can buy several tools and just see how they fit in your hand. Uh, I was always dropping one particular pruner. Finally, I said, why am I always dropping this thing? And what I realized when I took the time to really look, when these open up, it was wider than the palm of my hand and the tip of my fingers. So I would open it up and it would fall out of my hand. So Pay attention to how it fits in your hand. It will save you a lot of time uh, in the garden um, when you're going to um, picking, uh, doing some pruning of fruit trees or whatever you happen to be working on. Now, um, this lady here sitting on this little uh, garden uh, seat, this is fine. It wouldn't work for me because I don't have the trunk balance. And anybody who has uh, some core uh, trunk issues, um, uh, I wouldn't suggest using this. You would probably be spending more time picking yourself off the walkway than it would be beneficial. So um, you got to pay attention to that. And, uh, it, uh, 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 and um, But they come in, they work for some people and so on. Uh, this one here, again, um, uh, it works for this lady. But if she was watering it right now, then that may be a problem uh, uh, for what I stated earlier. But they come in handy. They work. They dry, as I said earlier. They dry out, and uh, it's something to pay attention to. Now, um, again, uh, one of my favorite tools, my wife's favorite. Oops, well, here we go. Uh, one of my favorite and my wife's is this um, potted plant dolly. You buy these on, uh, you can get them in a number of places. I bought mine on Amazon. It's a little different configuration. They're in the $60, $70 range, but who knows what that really is now. But this comes in really handy for moving things around the yard. Um, and also, I have uh, small protein, propane bottles I used on barbecue and, and other places. And it comes in really handy for moving those things around instead of me putting it on the lap. So um, it's something to uh, consider in the garden. Um, the other thing to consider 
is this garden cart uh, um, uh, kneeler, this one's called, that's the cart up there, but the garden kneeler, um, my wife loves this because most people I see who are, uh, you know, 60s and 70s, they'll say, I don't have a problem getting down, I have a problem getting up. And so by having something like this, it, it really is handy. Now, the advantage of these things are you use it that way as a kneeler, you flip it around and you sit on it. So it, it has a dual purpose. And um, so uh, if that's something that will work for you, don't be afraid to get it. I don't know the price of these now. They vary and, and so on. This guy up here, um, uh, the garden rolling cart, um, uh, is also handy, but I couldn't use it. Uh, but people and people who had some trunk uh, weak trunk muscles would also have difficulty using it, but it comes in really handy for a lot of different things. So if you need it, use it. You can see here how this woman is putting stress on her back, and then over in here, it's um, oh man, uh, it um, it's um, it's something to keep in mind with um, what's going on there. Um, of course, somebody's calling me. Um, we'll just put that off to the side. Um, so keep in mind your posture and how you go about working in the garden. Uh, safety strategies is um, really important. And obviously, using an electric mower in the rain in, isn't the smartest idea. Lucky for us here in Southern California, we don't get that much rain uh, of late. And... Um, so it's um, not that much of an issue, but um, keep in mind that uh, safety first. Gloves, I spoke briefly about that. Um, appropriate gloves, I found the ones that have the rubber padding tends to be uh, beneficial and they help with grip, as I mentioned. And if you're dealing with anything sharp uh, or roses or, or uh, berries, raspberries, all that sort of stuff, it's something to pay attention to. Lots of times I use gloves that come further up in the arms and that's a little more beneficial, particularly when I'm dealing with my cactus garden. Um, I was using welding gloves, dealing with some of those guys. And there's one particular plant um, that um, the thorns were so fine that it went through leather welding gloves and it would uh, bother your hands. So. And those strategies, you're working with that sort of stuff, uh, wrap the plant in old carpet or cardboard, then um, use a good heavy gloves and it, it will help out quite a bit. Aprons, I use leather to protect my lower limbs, primarily because with the lack of feeling uh, in that, and lots of times uh, as you get older, uh, you tend to not have the uh, nerve sensation that you had when you are younger. So protecting yourself with a, a good, strong apron is, is really important. Now, I'm a firm believer in avoiding these tools. Um, I've used them uh, out of my chair. Uh, and um, when this guy, when I would hit a rock using a digging bar, the vibrations would come up the bar, go into my elbows and shoulders. And then about two o'clock in the morning, laying in bed, it let me know I did something wrong. I firmly believe that the main purpose of these two tools is to teach young men the value of a higher education. Uh, you've spent a day using these things, you best um, find a better way of earning an income. Also, I firmly believe that if you have to use this stuff to um, prepare your garden, get a raised bed, pump it down, fill it with good soil, and um, go to work doing what you want to do. This sort of stuff is, is, is not uh, my idea of fun. Uh, another idea, these carts here, I can't remember now. I looked them up the other day. Um, but you can find these on a number of different sites. And I think they are under $100. Um, but um, 
it's really handy to have these in, uh, uh, available and you can just, you know, roll it out to the garden, use it, put it away, uh, keep things nice and, and orderly. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really a, a good way to go. If you're storing tools, like I talked earlier about numbering, easy to do, easy to um, hang. Um, and I think it looks pretty nice, but it's important to keep things organized and keep it uh, easy access uh, for um, easy mobility. And you know where things are. And one of the problems I run into when my shop is messy, I find it easier to go buy the tool than to um, um, try to find it. And so I may have, you know, many small tools and, and quantities that most people shouldn't have. You know, I got to go down to buy whatever that I'm working on. And I figure, ah, let's just get another whatever. And uh, so now I have um, squares and maybe three or four when I need one. But, you know, um, it's just the, the way it, um, of dealing with this stuff. Now, um, here's a little video that pretty much sums up everything I'm talking about. But one of the um, ideas is brought forward that kind of homed everything into me was these steps of, of, uh, that you're going to see here dealing with uh, uh, access. And this is what architects use and um, lots of designers use. And I've uh, incorporated it in my program to use uh, within the garden. So anyway, here we go. It's a few minutes long, so enjoy. The UCCE Master Gardener and Master Gardener Association of San Diego County brings you designing friendly, inclusive garden spaces with UCCE Master Gardener, Stephen Cantu. FIG stands for friendly, safe and easy movement around the garden and the right tool for the right job. Inclusive for all levels of ability and age gardens. In section A, we'll look at the seven principles of universal design. These seven principles are one, equitable use, two, flexibility in use, three, simple and intuitive use, four, perceptible information, five, tolerance for error, six, low physical effort, and seven, size and space for approach and use. Number one, equitable use. When designing your space, think of yourself and everyone that will be using your garden. Think of their age, think of their size, think of physical abilities. Will you or your intended users be bringing in pets? Can your space accommodate a wheelchair? Or planning ahead for a pregnancy during your gardening years? Number two, flexibility in use. There are many ways to achieve flexibility in the garden. Keep your tools in good shape and in easily accessible areas for you and your users. Decide how you and your users will access your beds. Consider appropriate bed heights. And for more vertical flexibility, you could use vertical gardening, container gardening, or espalier. There are pulley systems and raised beds on wheels to add lots of flexibility to any garden. Number three, simple and intuitive use. Make your designs user-friendly. Create wide, unobstructed pathways and workspaces. And always consider the intended flow of your space. Number four, perceptible information. It is important to communicate essential information clearly and precisely. Consider your intended users when making your signage and make it as perceptible as possible. Number five, tolerance for error. Always design with the right materials for the environment and the users. Be sure to consider drainage issues. Standing water, hoses, and tools can all present hazards. It is important to minimize hazards and adverse consequences. Number six, low physical effort. This principle allows for a workspace that will be effective, comfortable, and one that minimizes stress. And number seven, 
size and space for approach and use. Consider your path of travel, your workspace, your entrance and your exits. Make sure there is ample room to turn around, to work, to enter and to leave. Section B, tools. In our daily garden practices, there's a multitude of jobs that must be done. And there are tools for every job. Tools come in all shapes and sizes and some with special features, making them more adaptable to different needs. Here are some helpful design features for all users. Grippers can be used to reach into the middle of beds. Telescopic handles can also help with reaching. Some tools are equipped with arm support cuffs that can help with balance, strength, and leveraging issues. There are ergonomically designed tools and tools with soft grip handles. All of these tools fit in our friendly, inclusive gardening designs. Gardens feed our minds, bodies, and souls. Help us cultivate diversity together. Learn more about adaptable and inclusive gardens from the Master Gardener Association of San Diego County, www.mastergardenersc.org. Friendly Inclusive Garden Spaces is developed by Stephen Cantu, UCCE Master Gardener. This film was produced by C. Brown, UCCE Master Gardener and music by bensound.com. This film is a Black Swan Ranch production. Okay, guys. Um, I guess we got a couple minutes. If there's any questions, um, I'll be more than happy to try to answer. This is just a little view here of one aspect of my garden that I've been slowly working on. And I mean slowly been 20 years and I've just done some planting. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, any questions, I'll be um, trying to entertain them. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank you, Stephen. That was a great presentation. A lot of things that um, we as gardeners might not even be aware of. So thank you for bringing those to our attention. Um, we've got time for uh, one or two questions before we move on with our agenda, but thank you so much. Thank you. So if anybody wants to type anything in the chat or unmute and um, while people are typing or uh, I'll watch for people to unmute. I just want to say, yeah, Stephen, this was really I'm sort of even just thinking about uh, the slides that I have, the way I represent gardens um, in my presentations. I'm thinking about how both my grandma and I have spent a lot of time tripping and falling in the garden. Um, so this is a the things yeah. you brought up are relevant to everyone, and I, I could see where you say you know, um, you know that things are adapted right for every circumstance. Um, and uh, another thing that we talk a lot about, and I'm sure you know of Tom Spellman uh, with Dave Wilson's nursery, mm -hmm. he talks so much about um, tree height as well. I think he and people he've know he's known have fallen out of a lot of ladders and can really cause a lot of problems. So keeping your fruit trees down to a reasonable pruning height um, is also um, something that you can do for safety and accessibility in the garden. I um, mean, the oh, thing absolutely. about the- Absolutely. Um, and for fruit production also, I mean, it's better for the trees. And I know with my 30 some uh, fruit trees, I give away a lot of fruit. We can, we freeze and, um, um, but uh, yeah, um, how many oranges can you eat for God's sake, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, keeping that down uh, is, is reasonable. I got to admit, around my house with all my fruit trees, I'm not worried at all about scurvy, that's for sure. But um, <laughs> it is um, it, it is important to um, um, for a safety aspect and a health aspect to um, keep your fruit at a manageable level. And then I see Autumn, uh, you have your hand up. Um, I don't know if you wanted to unmute and ask a question or share. Um, I just had a question about, say if a garden has 
um, raised beds made out of wood, but they're not sure if it's treated or where it's from. Um, would it be, you know, a safe practice to line the beds or, you know, make sure that the soil isn't touching the wood, you know, if you're not sure where the wood is from or what's been done to it? Um, okay, so you're talking about treated materials um, and um, keeping the, the soil uh, away from the treated materials. Yes. Um, okay, so keep in mind that brown treated materials is designed to be next to soil. Um, green is, if you can still find it, is supposed to be next to concrete. Black or, or creosote, as you see in railroads, is meant for designs in very wet uh, water conditions. Um, so let's go back to what we mostly see and that's the brown tree of materials going next to um, soil. Um, it does help to put a plastic liner in there. They hold up fairly well if they don't, are not exposed to sunlight. When it's exposed to sunlight, the plastic deteriorates and falls apart and uh, you have then micro um, plastic particles that never go away. Um, I uh, would just prefer to um, forget the, the, the materials and go with the um, metal bands. Uh, I think that's a better way of going about it. Uh, but anyway, okay, so Yes, um, it does perform a barrier. Um, but again, if you're touching the um, treated materials and then touching your food, um, I, that to me is a problem. So keep that in mind and that's the biggest problem. Um, and then having the plastic covering up that it won't last long in the sunlight. So what do you do? Well, you can paint it, um, but then that's a, a, another issue. I, I, I think the best approach is uh, staying away from the wood. Um, the cost of the beds now, last I heard it was over $350 to build a, a bed and you can build roughly the same size um, uh, or you can buy the same size bed for a hundred and some dollars, $150. So it doesn't make sense anymore from a financial or physical standpoint to um, um, use the wood materials. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm clear on that and you um, got yeah, some ideas. You. Yeah. I agree. Well, I think um, we'll go ahead and uh, go to our next um, uh, partner we're gonna share with Stephen. Just thank you so much. Um, I Yeah, you're talking about the U-shaped gardens. Um, that was a really, uh, several of the comments you made on that slide from the height of the little cement strip to just being able to get out of that U-shaped garden, really eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. um, lots of comments in the chat about thanking you and um, people already looking forward to share this with people who weren't able to make it today. Um, so just uh, our heartfelt thanks for joining us today. Well, my um, and we pleasure. Look forward... And again, if anybody has any comments, they can um, drop me a line at com2 at cox.net. And I would appreciate any comments. Thank you. Wonderful. So Debbie or Stephen, if you want to drop the, that into the chat um, and then uh, feel free to email him with comments and questions. Um, I can tell you are a wealth of knowledge, Stephen. Very Thank good. You. Thank right. you. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great day. And we can, if you want to stay on with us Thank for the you. rest of the day or attend future workshops, we welcome you too. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go over to, we have one of our partners with us today um, and uh, they're going to share, oh, I reformatted the slide.